I'm Shana Roberts and I'm part of Brookside Big Local. And like many people in lots of communities or the whole of England, I had no idea what Big Local was. Um, I was just another resident who complained all the time about litter and crime and things not getting done. And I did the most responsible thing I could do and I would complain about it on social media. Um, and then one day I realized that I'd spent so long asking why no one had done this, why wasn't the council fixing things, why weren't the police fixing things, that I realised that I was someone and I was equally as accountable as anyone else. So I stepped outside my front door for the first time and looked to see what was out there and I found Brookside Big Local. And um, Brookside is definitely one of those left behind places. And I hate that term. And I guess the fear is, is that if we don't change things, we'll just see more of these left behind places. So this could be what's to come really, rather than what's been. So Brookside, uh, in our area, there's 5,000 people in the Brookside big local area. 38% uh, of children are in poverty. 40% of uh, residents don't have cars, no access to vehicles, and 31% of residents have no qualifications. We live in an area that is left behind, defined by the fact that we don't really have a high street, we don't really have a shopping centre, we don't have any businesses, any factories, we have two primary schools um, and a secondary school. But if you want to go and get a job somewhere, you have to travel. If you want to go to college, or university you have to travel so what we find is is that many people end up leaving the area or many people just get into that cycle of well this is my life this is how it's come it's never going to change so the great thing about big local is the fact it puts a million pounds in the hands of residents to say what changes do you want and that bottom-up thinking of empowering the people who live in it and experience it to make those decisions that will impact their neighbors their families their friends and over those five years, what we've been able to do is create this little network of people, not necessarily experts, or they're experts at being neighbours, they're experts at living in their estate. And we run monthly meetings where everyone's involved. We let, um, one of the biggest changes was just saying to people with kids, bring your kids along. Because what we found was, is that we were you know, missing out on a population of single parents who, were, who had skills, who had qualifications, we were feeling like they couldn't be included because of their children. So we made it a family event. We made it a social event. Also for big lo local funding, we were able to run employability workshops, training workshops, education workshops. We were able to get in external people to run sessions on mental health, physical health. We financed an outdoor gym, a minibus. We did regular litter picks with, with the scouts and our neighbors. We provided tech support, but we were very lucky because in many of the reports that local trusts have done, there's a great emphasis on the need for community spaces. And we were really lucky that we had a community centre that acts as our hub. And I know that a lot of the places listed don't have that, and that's one of the major failings. But the issue with that is, a community centre isn't really good when something like COVID-19 happens. Now, before COVID-19, before we went into lockdown, I think it was two days before lockdown, I actually spoke to a member of Brookside Big Local in the shop. And he was a 60 year old man who um, had a walking stick, had mobility issues. And the first time he'd ever left Brookside, his estate, the first time in seven years that he'd left the estate was last year at a big local conference that local trust was running. And that was the first time he'd left his estate and actually made an impact. And I said to him, you know, are you okay, Tony? And he says, no. He says, I'm petrified. I'm not petrified of being ill. I'm not petrified of catching anything, even though he should have been because he's on the shielding list. Tony was absolutely petrified at the thought of not seeing anyone, of being alone. His lifeline was the community centre. His lifeline was Brookside Big Local. And all of a sudden there was this threat that the community centre is going to shut down and I'm not going to be able to see anyone. I'm going to be alone. I'm not going to have access to the internet. I'm not going to have access to talk to people. And to hear that, that was really upsetting. But it was just a reflection of a small minority, well, of a large minority of Brookside and how they were going to be impacted. 
So for us, it was about changing the ways we had to engage with people. You know, we can't rely just on social media. You can't rely on, you know, the, the, the information that you did in the past. So for us, it was about creating partnerships. It was about Brookside Big Local going in, talking to our parish council, our town council, talking to local community groups like the Scouts and saying, you know, how do we help and identify people who need help? How do we recruit volunteers that can provide, you know, food parcels for those who are shielding, who can go shopping for those people? How can we work together to make sure that, you know, kids in school are still getting their lunches? And now we're looking at how we can provide um, some of um, some of breakfasts for kids within the summer holidays and how we can organize those activities and luckily enough we had a cafe in the community center so even though we weren't necessarily allowing members of the public in there was a core staff that was kept as essential workers including big local volunteers who were able to organize that but the thing is is that even though we promoted positivity on social media and we encourage people to get involved with whatsapp and register their streets so people could stay together what we realized from covid19 is though it's a shared experience it's not an equally shared experience and my biggest problem and the biggest thing that i've seen is digital exclusion you know people on low income or older people have no access to net or limited access to technology you know, our community center had a library, our community center had computers. So if people didn't have technology, they could go into these spaces and they didn't have those spaces anymore. How do we maintain that connection? I'm really afraid that we're gonna have a whole generation of children, especially in our estate, who are already left behind, who now have no way of catching up because they don't have that technology. We have families with three children from the same school who have access to a smartphone and that was it. How are they meant to access the information that other people do if they do have the technology to hand? So we're starting to think about ways that we can support going forward and that's by helping people who've lost their jobs or got put on furlough and looking for upskilling and retraining opportunities that we can work with partners that provide that freely to unemployed people in our area. And it's also about looking at what businesses can do in our area, you know, making them accountable as well to help their community. So looking at blended learning, online stuff, uh, Q and A's with people in businesses so students can find career information. What this has done is it has seen the importance of public spaces, the importance of bottom up transition, and the importance of empowering people to make the decisions for themselves and their community. But what COVID-19 has done is also, it's demonstrated those gaps between the left behind areas and other spaces. And I think even though we've done as much as we can, it's about getting those connections going forward. And I always say that at the end of this, it's not about Whitehall telling people what to do, it's about neighbours helping neighbours.